I am Tere Shaheen. I worked for 10 plus years in China on uh, telecommunications and high technology. And then I became the chairman of the American Institute in Taiwan. And now I do a bunch of stuff. And, and one of the things I do is I'm a contributor to the National Review. This is Nicholas Eberstadt, American genius. <laughs> and the Henry Wendt uh, Chair at the American Enterprise Institute. And today we are going to talk about right-sizing China. OK? <laughs> boo, I'm going boo, boo, boo. OK, it is a problem, I think, today in, in the United States that we think that China is a, a bigger, it's bigger than it is, OK? We're going to try to get China in the Goldilocks zone, OK? Not too big, not too small. But let's just see it, what it for what it is, all right? Um, Nick is very formative in my views of China because in 2001, when I was um, just about to take my position as chairman, he was co-author of a book that was published by Rand called The Fault Lines in the Chinese Economic Terrain. And in that book, they laid out pretty much every single problem you see in China today. And isn't that so true of a command and control economy? 40 years, 60 years before that, when you lay out dictates like the one child policy, you know, we're going to do the, the north south water transfer project, all those things, that sooner or later the chickens come home to roost, okay? Now, the biggest thing that, that's come into the news today is the one child policy. And just recently, in, uh, around the time of the Davos, uh, um, the World Economic Forum, the Chinese, uh, uh, the, the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences came out and said, uh, in about 2100, we're going to have 587 million people, less than half of what we have today. Now, that may seem like a long time away, but it has real consequences in the next 10, 15 years because of those 20 to 40 year olds that are supposed to be the most productive part of the economy. So, Nick's going to talk more about that. So let's talk about, let's say, let's just take 10 things that we think will really right-size China in terms of really where it is today. It's not really as big as it is in people's minds. One is, it's going to be a much smaller share of global GDP. Now remember, in the early 90s, the former Soviet Union was the second largest economy in the world. OK? Now it's not even in the top 10. It's got a smaller economy than Belgium. All right? Now, it doesn't mean it's not a heap load of problems. It is. But it is not even, it, it's got the economy the size of New York City. All right? Now, what are the components of GDP? GDP equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. The biggest part of that is consumption. In the United States, it's almost 70% of our GDP. In China, it's 40%. A lot smaller, but still a big part of its GDP. That's why everybody wanted part of that big Chinese pie. But those 20 to 40 year olds that are now a lot smaller part of the Chinese demography are, are getting a smaller and smaller, smaller part. Nick's going to talk about that. All right. Second point is, Chinese households were 70% invested in the house, household in, in, in the real estate market. Now, that has been well socialized. Chinese real estate market is in shambles, is in shambles. Investment in that is a trickle. GDP in China is so heavily dependent on real estate, it's about 30% of Chinese GDP. OK, that includes everything with cement, plastic, timber, et cetera, et cetera. So you got one on top of the other, on top of the other, OK? China has spent so much money at the national level, at the provincial level, at the local level, at the city level, on works projects that any more money that's put into the economy is the law of diminishing marginal returns. We're not going to get much more productivity out of it. OK. Next point. How do you get more productivity? Your people. 
There's a very famous scholar from Stanford University named Scott Rosell. He has written a number of books. One of them is called The Two Chinas. But here he talks about the real problem of education in China. There's only about 30% of Chinese that graduate high school. It, it, it's an amazing statistics because, statistic because we see all these uh, Chinese nationals coming to our universities and here and then abroad. But only about 30% graduate high school and about 50% graduate elementary school. He says something even more startling. He says about 400 million Chinese are cognitiv cognitively impaired. This is the generations that are coming up now. Now, how does he make this claim? It is very, very startling. He says this group, this is the two Chinas he's talking about. Not, how he explains the two Chinas is this, okay? Those of you that don't follow China, like Nick and I. There's the group that is on the coast and some in, that are close to the coastline, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, okay? They're, they're the urban dwellers. And then you have the migrant workers that are coming from the countryside. Those people have had to leave their children in the care of their parents or an older sibling. And those young children or those babies have been, according to Dr. Roselle, have been raised as peasants. So you feed them, you take care of them, you make sure they don't die, but they're not stimulated. So any of you that have been to an orphanage know that it's often quiet. Because babies are smart too. If they know they're not going to get picked up, they don't cry. So there's a failure to thrive. Um, they often have parasites. Uh, they may have problems with their eyesight. It's not you know, detected. And there's something called babynomics that Scott talks about. He said, by three years old, if these babies are not stimulated, their IQ gets stuck at below 90. So that means there would be in special ed in the United States. So God bless Scott Rosell and hope that the Chinese don't <laughs> do anything to him. But that's, those are his findings, and they are published. OK, next problem. China has a water crisis. They have 20% of the world's population and only 7% of the world's fresh water. Serious problem. And terrible pollution. Terrible pollution. Cancer, number one cause of death. Next, China has a food insecurity problem. They only have 50% food security. Some people say it's like 70% because the other 20% is due to the fact they have to import seed and fertilizer to get to the 50% that they say they have. Next, energy insecurity. They're very, very dependent on coal. Coal, 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 which is why people are dying of cancer in China. Um, they have to import 60 to 80% of their crude oil. That's another problem. Let me go for a second to the military before I pass it off to Nick. Um, much has been said about the Chinese military and all the ships and planes and everything they're building. The Chinese military was built on the basis of Russian technology, for starters. Um, they licensed it, they stole it, and now they're having buyer's remorse, or let's say theft remorse, because they stole a lot of it, just like they stole a lot of other stuff. <laughs> Um, and they improved on it, okay, so I'm not going to say that they didn't do that. But uh, now they're seeing in Ukraine that it's a bunch of junk. Um, so this is a problem. So they have a lot of numbers, but this is the base of their, basis of their military. And there's a lot of corruption. They have an old style, like Victorian England, where you can buy commissions and buy promotions. And they use a lot of their military uh, troops to uh, you, uh, do public works or do whatever else that the uh, senior military guys want them to do. And that corruption, of course, permeates the rest of Chinese society, which makes uh, infrastructure poor. You've heard maybe of tofu uh, buildings, tofu bridges, things like that that don't work. Um, and um, uh, basically, you've got 
uh, you know, a lot of problems throughout, up and down, vertically and horizontally, because of corruption in society. Um, lastly, on this list, there's, I could go on and on with problems in, in China, is um, social stability. Now, you all saw pictures just before uh, COVID zero was lifted of the protests in China. But that's the tip of the iceberg. And we have, which is what I started with, was demographics. So we have serious problems with social stability in China. And with that, I will leave it to the expert on that, Dr. Eberstadt. Yeah, Nick? Yes, sir. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing that assessment with all of us, Therese. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you all for inviting me here. Uh, it's a really impressive roster of talent you've brought together for this, uh, for this gathering, and I'm uh, delighted to be included in it. Um, when we think about the threat from, uh, from China, or more uh, specifically from the CCP that uh, has hijacked China, and uh, uh, the enormous uh, uh, captive population that it controls and commands. I think we ought to, uh, ought to begin by thinking about uh, a country that I have a kind of a sick fascination with, uh, <laughs> North Korea. I, uh, I've spent way too much time trying to follow and understand North Korea. Um, I'm an economist, and um, North Korea's GDP, approximately, if we're just going to round, uh, is zero. And <laughs> a, a country with an economy, with a GDP of zero, can cause a lot of trouble in yeah. the world. It can cause a lot of trouble, outsized trouble, if it is, uh, if it is commanded by a uh, revisionist regime that's uh, hostile to the U.S. and the U.S. interests. Um, there, was a, there was a government that was, had a larger population and a kind of a bigger economy than North Korea, Imperial Japan, and I think we can remember if we stroll down memory lane, uh, they caused a little bit of trouble for us a while ago as well. China's a much bigger country. It's got a much bigger economy than that. Uh, and we should bear in mind the, um, uh, the threats that a hostile uh, government can pose to us and to our allies and to the international architecture of finance and security that we uh, worked so hard to create after World War II. I don't think, Therese, that we're in danger of being surpassed uh, and replaced economically by China. I don't think that's anything that we need to worry about. I have a, a colleague at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, Derek Scissors, who's done a very precise yeah, calculation. Excellent. And he's um, figured out the exact day and year and time when China surpasses the United States, and that is never. So that's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <clears throat> but, uh, but he, uh, E even, even in the second or third position, a big, powerful economy will, uh, and, a, and a regime in control of a lot of nuclear weapons and a yeah. large military can, uh, 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 has to be, uh, has to be uh, treated with all of the attention that uh, a big threat deserves. Uh, one of the threats that, one of the threats that uh, the Chinese regime poses to us today that the Soviet Union did not pose to us comes from a failed bet that the United States and uh, mainly the United States made. It was a bipartisan bet in the late 70s and early 80s. And this was the idea that by um, welcoming the PRC into the world economy, integrating into the US economy, welcoming the, really the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, into the apparatus of global governance that we'd helped to create, uh, that would not only um, lead to prosperity and reduction of poverty in China and spillover benefits economically for the rest of the world, but that we'd also see a, uh, 
a reforming of the uh, communist system and, uh, and even maybe a move from alignment towards friendship with the United States. Well, it's been 40 plus years. Um, it, was not a, it was not an unreasonable bet uh, originally, but it obviously is a bet that hasn't panned out the way that we uh, thought. It's panned out very badly. Um, and now we are in a situation where the, uh, the CCP really, uh, through the vehicle of the Chinese economy, is integrated into our society and into our economy and into our nation domestically in a way that the Soviet Union never could hope to influence us. So, I mean, uh, you, never, you never saw the NBA uh, grovel before the uh, Communist Party <laughs> of the Soviet Union. Uh, you, you never saw Disney uh, try to make nice with Brezhnev. Um, the commercial power that uh, that the CCP can now deploy against, uh, against us politically from within our society adds a whole new wrinkle to the kind of complex uh, struggle that we have in trying to uh, contain and minimize and, um, I, forgive me for saying this, but eventually triumph over this, uh, over this threat. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the why, even though in uh, the, the projections of uh, China being half its size in 2100, why we, were, we are going to see a big change in the next 10 or 15 years which the, with the 20 sure. and 40 year olds sure. really going down in population? over sure. the next 10 to 15 years. Sure. And, 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 and marriage rates and things like that. You've absolutely. Talked about. And, yeah. um, and although this, uh, this to me suggests uh, long-term vulnerability and weakness, uh, that doesn't make uh, the CCP want to necessarily play any nicer with us. It may, yeah, it may actually make the, make the government more aggressive in a shorter time frame. So, uh, since the end of the uh, abhorrent uh, one-child uh, forcible population control policy, which was uh, suspended, not, not repudiated, just temporarily suspended, the government uh, said it maintained its uh, prerogative to uh, involve itself in Chinese families. Since the, that suspension in 2015, uh, We've seen a drop in births in China of about half, 50%. It's the sort of thing that you'd expect during a famine. It's not the sort of, or like uh, during a war shock. It's not something you'd expect ordinarily during um, uh, peaceable order. Uh, it, it's also matched by a plunge in marriages in China. Um, so we're, we're seeing a flight from marriages and a flight from babies. And what explains this? Well, uh, if I were to conjure up William of Ockham and ask him what Ockham's razor tells us about this, right? Um, I think Ockham's razor would say it's a sign of a tremendous shift in national sentiment or mood under the Xi Jinping dictatorship uh, and under the you know, new repressive mechanisms that the Xi regime has been perfecting in China. Uh, what it means in practice uh, for the future, as you said, is that the next generation is going to be maybe half as large, maybe slightly less than half as large as the current uh, generation of childbearing age. Um, and that has great implications for labor force and for the economy. We're clearly past the era of heroic economic growth in China. Uh, it, has, uh, it has real implications, I think, for uh, society as well. I think this is a, we're talking about an aging society where the attention has to be towards uh, older people, uh, middle-aged people taking care of large, large, large numbers of older people and not so many children. It's a, uh, I think it's a pretty pessimistic uh, future that we're seeing yeah. there. Very pessimistic. Yeah. And 20 to 40 year olds, I mean, this is true in every society. Yeah. They're the consumers. 
I mean, uh, then you get to 40 to, you know, 50 year old, 40 to 60 year old, they're, you know, capital investment, getting ready for retirement. But, you know, I'm going to speak for myself, 20 to 40, I'm buying, buying, buying. Um, my husband can attest to that. And then afterwards, oh, it's, you know, let's, let's look to the future. And that's true for every society. So I think, and I've read and, and listened to you many, many times, that um, this is really going to have a big uh, impact on consumption. And of course, that's the number one factor in GDP. It's really going to affect their GDP, even though we have to wait till the end of the century to see those numbers really drop off. We're going to see consumption drop off very quickly as we see those numbers of the young people drop off sooner. Does that make some sense? Well, let me ask you a question yeah. about military implications here. Yes, please. I think you, I think you yes. f follow that pretty closely. Yes. So we, we now are seeing the emergence in China of a one-child PLA, right? Yes. Because you've got a, increasingly a one-child society that's being, uh, you know, growing up in, uh, in, in PRC. And that means that the recruits are coming from a one-child society. There's going to be an even greater uh, prevalence of one-child families uh, 20 years from now. Uh, how, does the, how does the Chinese leadership make the calculations ab about uh, what happens with mass casualties in a circumstance where casualties are going to end a lot of family lines? I mean, in, in China, in a Confucian tradition uh, culture, uh, the end of the family line is like a metaphysical catastrophe. I mean, it's yeah. always a tragedy to lose a child, but it's a metaphysical you know, yeah. catastrophe. Is, is that going to make the, uh, is the Chinese government going to be surprised by this? Are they aware of this already, and is it going to make them more hesitant for uh, confrontation than we would have expected? It seems to me it might be a kind of a wild card, and I don't know how to think it through. I, I would absolutely think so. I mean, it, it, to make the presumption that the Chinese love their children less than we do yeah. is, uh, is horrific. Yeah. And, and to have your only child be sent off to war, I mean, you know, is, 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 hor is horrifying. And I, I, I do think that that's the case. And now we have this other part of the social instability where you've got many more men not having ladies to marry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this has caused another whole problem. And you have a problem where the men that maybe have found a lady can't get married because a woman won't marry him because he doesn't have an apartment because the apartment isn't finished yet. So that's another aspect of the social instability. So you've got, you've got, you know, again, layers on layers and layers of problems caused by Communist Party command and control dictates. This is what happens when you don't have a free market. You don't have, you don't have a feedback repair loop. And now, and now the CCP has gone from the previous uh, routine of collective leadership to a, a single kind of supreme leader, and the. The quality of judgment for this guy doesn't look like so super hot. I mean, I mean, you, you take a look at what at what happened with the uh, with the awful yeah. lockdowns in, yes. uh, in China. You take a look at some of the other obvious mistakes that he's made. I mean, one of the things I think we have to bear very much in mind is the possibility that the supreme leader uh, miscalculates, and we have to be um, we have to encourage. Uh, through deterrence and through American strength and American diplomacy and, uh, well, I think I'm speaking to the expert on the diplomacy and the <laughs> alliance building here, no. but, we have to, but we, have to tend, uh, we have to tend to all of that so as to make it unthinkable for, uh, for a guy who seems to have a bad uh, decision quality to make bad decisions internationally. Yes, I, I think that brings us to another point, and I, sent you this article uh, yesterday. Um, many articles about Xi Jinping have made him larger than life, just like we make China larger than life, like Xi, the all-powerful, you know, he's the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. And of course, we know at the end of the story of the Wizard of Oz, it's just one guy, and he's, he's got these levers, you know, it's like, pay no attention to the man. Yeah. And I kind of think there's a little bit of that going on there. 
Um, if you see the policies that have happened, especially post zero COVID, yeah. they're getting a bit schizophrenic. Um, China just finished their equivalent of their Davos meeting, and they had their new premier that was just uh, announced, uh, yeah. Li Chang, Li Chang yeah. who said China will be the new uh, uh, base of tranquility and peace in the region. Yeah. I mean, we just got finished looking at these pictures of COVID where people are protesting, there's fires in apartments, you know, people jumping out of buildings, it, you know, all these guys in hazmat suits look like the Clone Wars. I mean, they're going to be the, you know, the example of peace and stability in the region. And, in the region. and then Xi Jinping is, is, is pounding his fist on the table saying, he who, you know, lives by fire will die by fire, you know, misquoting the Bible, the biggest atheist. Okay, so, all right, let's not go there. But in any case, um, the, the messaging seems quite schizophrenic which makes me think he's a little off his game. And um, he's, uh, he, had, um, he, had, um, um, he had banished Jack Ma. Now Jack Ma is back. Maybe, maybe you all have seen that in the news. He had, um, he had, done, he had put, uh, put forth a lot of draconian policies, which now have hurt the economy, as well as zero COVID. And now he's reversing himself which also to me are cues, I don't know what, what you think about yeah. this, Nick, yeah. that perhaps he's either losing some power, losing his footing, perhaps there's a little bit more collective leadership going on. Um, I've talked to some other people, uh, they, they think that perhaps this might be happening, but I'd like to know your opinion on it. Well, in The Wizard of Oz, doesn't uh, the wizard <laughs> say, oh, uh, I'm a very good man, I'm just a bad wizard. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. I think he, he, yes, he's not like The Wizard possible. of Oz in this, uh, in this regard. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you, when you look at what the, um, what the economic policies have been under Xi Jinping, yeah. the close down of the economy, putting uh, party cells in all of the major yeah. businesses, seems to have a pretty, uh, it seems to have quite a bit of equanimity about mediocre economic performance for his country. Yes. As China uh, becomes, I don't know if we'd say uninvestable, but less attractive as yeah. an investment internationally. The, uh, the security we've mentioned, uh, the, uh, when, when, you, when you have someone in a, a country that's, uh, well, if you have somebody who's running Germany who has a bad quality of judgment, that's a problem. When you have uh, somebody running a country that's much larger than that, it's a bigger problem. And I think our, our task as, uh, as Americans is to protect the security of our, uh, of our area uh, through the system that we've arranged uh, since the end of the World War II and uh, to help our allies protect themselves, we can, we can do that and we can make the China problem smaller, the CCP problem smaller, but it won't make itself smaller. It has no intention of making itself smaller. Um, but we've, we have so, we do not quite realize how many options uh, we have in approaching this internationally. American power has been extraordinary in the post-Cold War era. And I'm not sure we even understand how, much, how many different instruments and options we have. I, we, I should use them. we could use them a lot better than we're doing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I think that's uh, very well said, Vic. very well said. Especially the, the comment, he might be a good man, but he's a very bad wizard. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>